Right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, Info Day uh, on the 2023 CEF Military Mobility Call. Uh, I am Olivier Silla. I'm the head of department here at CINEA in charge of the Connecting Europe facility. And uh, for this Info Day, we have about two hours. We will first uh, have an overview on the projects that have been selected so far and give you also an overview on where we stand overall in the implementation of the program. Uh, right after that, uh, we will have a description of the policy context of the call. This will be done by my colleague uh, from DG Move, uh, Philippe Chantraine. And then we will move into the details. We will look into the priorities of the call we will look into the application process in e-grant, uh, and we will tackle a certain number of other specific points, like in particular the climate proofing, that is a requirement under this call. Uh, we will look into more details into the evaluation process and what or what criteria we are using for that. We will check the admissibility and eligibility elements and um, especially share with you some lessons learned, some mistakes that you should not do. And uh, after that, uh, of course, we will have a question and answers session as usual, and uh, you have the possibility to send us your questions during the presentations. All material will be available on our website at the page where you have seen the link to this uh, info day. It might be available as from tomorrow, the time that everything is checked and uploaded, but everything will be available for those who perhaps are not able to follow this afternoon, including the recording of the presentations made this afternoon. Uh, so with that, I will uh, perhaps uh, start with uh, recalling the overall timing. The call was opened on the 3rd of May. The deadline for submission is on the 21st of September, of September 2023. As usual, we always remind that it is very important not to wait for the last minute, not for the last hour, and preferably not for the last day to send your applications. Uh, it's an IT system. There is no possibility in case you are too late to save the proposal, so very important that you enter your proposal in time with all the requested documents. We will run the evaluations between September and December 2023, and you will be informed about the results around uh, January. And from there, for those who are selected, uh, the grant agreement preparation will start, and the objective is to sign then the grant agreements uh, by the 1st of June 2024. We, are, um, we had so far two calls uh, concerning military mobility. Uh, the results have been published. We started uh, with um, a first call uh, with an allocation of 327 million. It was uh, the very first, so perhaps uh, there was still the need to uh, prepare projects and make also the instrument better known. And we've seen already from the second call in 2022 that uh, the allocation was uh, almost doubled with an allocation of 616 uh, million. And of course, uh, this is far from the requested amounts. Each time we see that the call is uh, oversubscribed. So for 2023, we are also expecting a quite high level of uh, oversubscription, we hope. Um, in terms of budget, let's have a quick look at where we stand. So overall, uh, we have awarded already uh, about 54% uh, of the budget available for the whole period 21-27. These are the two calls, 21 and 22, I was referring to. And uh, out of these 54%, you can see how uh, the actions are distributed between the modes. Uh, it's about 35% for rail, 
uh, road is taking also an important uh, share with 28%. This is, I would say, more than in the traditional uh, safe calls. And also, very importantly, we have substantial interventions in airports with 21% of the allocated funds. And last but not least, ports with 16%. This gives an idea on the possibilities uh, that are offered uh, for these uh, four modes. Clearly, we are now today to speak about the uh, remaining part, the 46% that we are putting on the table in one go. So this 2023 call, uh, if, of course, we receive a sufficient application for that, would allow us to allocate entirely the remaining uh, budget, uh, which is about 793 million euro. Here uh, you will uh, see a map uh, where uh, we have represented our areas of interventions uh, in green, perhaps a bit small in your screen, uh, on your screen uh, is the 2021 uh, selected actions. Uh, in blue, the 2022, you see that we are covering quite a wide geographical area with intervention in uh, almost all EU member states. However, with a clear, um, uh, let's say, focus uh, in these two selections uh, on the central and eastern part of Europe. Uh, that's, that's the situation for the first two calls. We'll see, of course, uh, how we go about in the 2023 call. It is also clear, and my colleague will also mention that, that the policy context is also important to take into account. Um, so briefly, concerning the project that we have underway, uh, as regards railway infrastructure for civil defense sorry, for civil defense dual use. We, just to give you an idea on the type of intervention that are possible and that we have seen and selected, um, clearly one element relates to the facilitation of rail freight, in particular uh, the upgrade of tracks to accommodate longer trains, 740 meter long trains. We have also interventions relating to the capacity and the specifications of railway bridges, sidings, terminals, especially with a focus on the solidarity lanes. But we could also support the construction of a new railway line and other railway infrastructure to connect, for instance, a railway station with an airport or other type of railway infrastructure, as long, of course, as they are justified both from a civilian and military mobility angle. We are supporting a certain number of airports, um, and there I'd say we cover a broad range of interventions in airports. It uh, could be simply the construction or the reconstruction or the extension of a runway or a taxiway. Uh, we can upgrade the lightning, the lighting, the visualization systems for ground traffic navigation at airports. We can also tackle a certain number of IT dimensions uh, from air traffic management uh, to air surveillance systems at airports. We, uh, we also have in our portfolio a certain number of road infrastructure. We uh, have very simple interventions like the reinforcement of uh, viaduct along the road, uh, a certain number of uh, bridges, uh, extension of capacity, the reconstruction of certain uh, roads. It could also be new roads. So again, here what matters is that it brings a benefit both on the civilian and military mobility dimension. So in our portfolio, we already have quite a, a large type of interventions. Last but not least, maritime. So in ports, we are supporting already for instance, the construction of uh, intermodal terminals or the expansion of, of terminals in ports. We are also supporting, for instance, the construction of new berths. Uh, improving the uh, motorway connection in the port is also another type of activity. 
and more generally, everything that has to do with the connection of the port with the interland, which facilitate the uh, flow of uh, freight and, and, and uh, in and outside the port. So, for instance, uh, railway infrastructure in and to the port, uh, connecting uh, connected railway stations in the port and so on. And, of course, with always a perspective on the solidarity lanes. So this was to give you a bit a flavor of what we have already supported. And I can only invite you, if you would like to know more, to consult uh, our public dashboard, where you have the exact list of all the projects supported, not only under military mobility, but in general supported by the CEF and supported by uh, CINEA. But if you focus on the military mobility project there, you will find the exact description of each of the actions and give, can give you, give you also a more precise idea of the type of project we have supported in the past, and that would help you to prepare future application. With that, I'm very happy to hand over the floor to my colleague, uh, Philippe Chantraine from DG Move, uh, who will um, introduce to you the policy context of this call for proposals. Philippe. Thank you very much, Olivier. Good afternoon to all here joining us online. I'm very happy to present to you the policy context of this call. Um, and um, I will go do so by uh, going a few years back because the whole exercise on military mobility started already in 2018 uh, when uh, it was uh, noted that uh, the transport of military assets was hampered and uh, there were several issues that uh, the uh, military forces uh, identified uh, when trying to transport military assets, which are heavier, larger, uh, and uh, troops, which are uh, of a, a bigger size to move them efficiently across Europe. Part of the problem is related, obviously, to transport infrastructure. And hence, the idea was to uh, see whether we can link this to the Trans-European Transport Network policy, the 10 policy, and make sure that uh, our network is fit for purpose also when it comes to military mobility. The um, situation, of course, changed in a global context with the uh, Russian war of aggression against Ukraine in February last year. Uh, and since then, things have only accelerated uh, also when it comes to our military mobility envelope within the Connecting Europe facility. As a political uh, step, the Military Mobility Action Plan 2.0 was presented on the 10th of November, uh, where uh, not only we could take stock of certain uh, improvements that were reached already based on the first action plan, but uh, also broadening uh, the uh, scope of what we uh, try to do to improve military mobility in Europe. Um, and in particular, given the new context, uh, we are in uh, with the Russian war of aggression. So in this context, we have accelerated, and Olivier has already presented, uh, that uh, the results of the two first calls um, where uh, we were able to allocate uh, already a substantial part of the um, military mobility envelope, um, which leaves us now with this call, the third call, uh, where we have proposed and where member states endorsed the approach to provide all the money that is still available for the military mobility activities under the Connecting Your Facility in this last call of 2023. Last call, of course, um, in the sense that this will be the allocation of all the available funds and to be seen if there are future reinforcements or reflow calls to be handled. But this will, uh, for the time being, be the last call under military mobility, exhausting the available budget. In terms of policy context, it is important to note that uh, we are working uh, in parallel on the revision of the 10T regulation, which will 
uh, include additional elements relating to military mobility, so to enhance the uh, synergies between the civilian and the military aspects of infrastructure development. This revision is still ongoing. Parliament and Council are uh, negotiating this new regulation, which we foresee to uh, be applicable as of next year. So it will not have a direct impact on this call we are carrying out uh, uh, right now. Um, also, a development which is important is the update of the EU military network, which is uh, handled by the Council. And here the Council in May adopted a revised uh, military network. And I can confirm that it will be this revised network which will be the basis for the application and the evaluation of this call. So all sections which are uh, newly added to the military network will be eligible um, in this call, subject to the conditions we will, of course, specify uh, further on. Uh, but the condition to be on the military network will be measured based on this new council decision. With that, I invite also Victor to uh, join me here. But I will. Victor? With that, we turn to the priorities of the call, and um, I will still start before handing over to, to Victor here, sitting right next to me. So um, the indicative budget of this call is 790 million, which is the reminder of the military mobility budget. Um, as uh, well, the uh, overall budget we had for the period 21 to 27 was 1.69 billion euros. And of course, given these circumstances, there was no other way than to make this budget uh, available as quickly as possible because the needs are high and we see a good uptake from projects and project promoters in the past two calls. Looking at the eligibility, um, as uh, Olivier has already explained, uh, projects for all transport modes are eligible. Of course, we are encouraging uh, to uh, present projects in particularly on cross-border movements because here the European added value is the highest. Um, we have certain standards which have an important bearing also on cross-border movements like the 740 meter trains or the loading gauge for railways. Uh, road bridges were already mentioned. They are often a bottleneck when it comes to movements, but also port capacity, connectivity and the transshipment between the different modes. When it comes to the eligibility, it is important to underline that the projects must meet three requirements. First of all, it has to be on the 10T network. The 10T network as defined in the regulation 1315 of 2013. Secondly, it has to be on the EU military transport network as defined in the revised council decision. And Thirdly, it has to be in line with the dual-use infrastructure requirements, the implementing regulation of 2021 with the number 1328. Um, so here, these are the three elements that any project has to comply with in order to be eligible. Um, just to note that if there are projects which exceed the dual-use requirements, then um, the co-funding might be lower because uh, we normally finance up to the dual-use requirements. So to be clear on that, any project has to demonstrate use for the civilian side and for the military side. And um, only if it is compliant with requirements on the two sides, so the famous dual-use requirements, it is eligible. For projects under the military mobility calls, a CBA is not mandatory. This is a difference to our standard calls in the Connecting Europe facility. 
This is obviously due to the certain natures of certain interventions which might be required. Uh, and um, hence, it is not mandatory, but of course, a well-justified project uh, is always needed. The co-funding rate um, for projects goes up to 50% of the eligible costs. So um, our uh, grants would reach 50% of the eligible cost. And uh, the proposals are uh, evaluated based on the award criteria. So here, a couple of comments. The award criteria are the same criteria as we usually use under the SEF transport calls. And of course, the military aspect has to be taken into account in the evaluation. We do so under the award criteria priority and urgency, where we combine the assessment provided by the EU military staff. And Victor will explain now how this, will, uh, the, how this functions, where we combine the assessment by the EU military staff with the assessment of our experts who are looking at the civilian side of the project. In this assessment, globally, of course, we heavily take into account the changed geopolitical environment um, because, of course, this is, for the time being, the main political priority uh, since the war of aggression. And uh, this is duly taken into account when we uh, provide the points under the priority and urgency criteria. And I hand over now to Victor, who will present from the EU, uh, the, uh, how the military side is evaluating the projects. Please. Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, again for the second time. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Captain Victor Kurel. I work for the EU military staff, the logistics directorate. Our office um, is supporting this initiative uh, with the military uh, element, in military evaluation, and we are also the office that developed uh, the military requirements that finally got approved. Um, compared to last year, um, the criteria is about the same. What we do have uh, as, a, as a change is what Philip already mentioned. Uh, this year in uh, May, um, the Council uh, uh, approved the modified military network. Uh, you will find it as Annex 2 if you don't know what... Uh, I'm sure your military uh, officials know, know about it, and you can also find it in the delegates portal. Um, but let's go back to the, to the criteria. The same as last year, we are looking at uh, two criteria, and each criteria has four um, smaller uh, sub-criteria. Um, the first criteria is to what extent does the proposed project contribute uh, to the enhanced strategic uh, deployment of military forces in the European Union for missions, operations, and routine activities. And uh, in order to make a more um, accurate uh, evaluation, we, we divided this into four uh, sub-criteria. The first one is, to what extent does the project contribute to cross-border synergies? The second one, to what extent does the project contribute to enhanced um, EU battle group uh, strategic deployment, including the potential strategic deployment leg. Then the third one, to what extent does the project contribute to the strategic deployment for one of the EU uh, CSDP, common security and defense policy scenarios? And the last one, last criteria for this one, uh, is the project proposal in line with the member states' national military mobility plan? There is a council conclusion on this uh, 25th of June 2018. And then for the um, second criteria, um, to what extent does the proposed project eliminate um, identified gaps in the infrastructure network of the, of the member states, including bottlenecks currently undermining military movements? And as I said, this one also has the four um, sub-criteria. First one is to what extent Will the project facilitate movement of military or an oversized or overloaded assets? Uh, does it have an impact on decreasing congestion on the transport and multimodal nodes? To what extent is it connected to the uh, entire uh, or the main um, 
transport network of the member states and also of the European Union? And to what extent will the project provide unrestricted access to the military for um, routine activities? Um, this, is, this is the list of uh, criteria, sub-criteria. They are included in the call. Uh, you have received it. Um, I want to ask you to please refer to these uh, uh, questions that we are looking to answer in your documentation when you, when you submit the documents. And um, we are, of course, uh, available to answer any of your questions either directly uh, to address to our, our office or uh, to Digimove or Cinea, um, if, if you want to address them that, that way, from now until the until September when the deadline is for the call. And that's it from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm Natasha Harassi. I'm the call coordinator of this military mobility call from uh, Cinea. And uh, here I will present to you uh, the application process in eGrant, starting by um, how to find uh, the call. Um, you will have to you will have the main website of the Frontier Contenders Opportunities Portal, and there uh, on the main page you will have different programs. Uh, of course, the Connecting Europe facility is one of them, and it is highlighted here. Once you click on it, uh, you will be taken to a new page which uh, contains different information, such as the uh, description of the program and its priorities, uh, some news items, but also uh, a search tool where you can search for all the published uh, call for proposals under the SEF program. So here, either you can search, if you're interested in this military mobility call, either you can search directly by uh, click, uh, writing military mobility, or you can click on the view button uh, that is highlighted here, uh, in order to see uh, the, all the published calls. So in this specific case, I have, um, I have indicated MILMOB for military mobility and selected the options of open for submission. And here you will see the only topic that is open under this uh, 2023 military mobility call. As you can see, the topic reads uh, MILMOB works, but even uh, if it only read works, it's important to note that study projects can also be submitted under uh, this topic, as well as works and mixed projects. So please have a look here at the uh, call document and, and the uh, topic descriptions in order to um, know exactly what are the conditions uh, under this topic. So once you select the topic, you will have uh, this page that you see and um, you will have different, um, um, different sections. For example, uh, the topic descriptions, uh, the conditions and documents where you will have the call document, and you will have the uh, topic-related FAQs, the frequently asked questions, as well as, the, as well as the submission services. I will not go in detail in each one of them, but I strongly recommend you to have a look at, uh, at these different sections. Uh, before submitting uh, any proposal. Um, but what I would like to uh, go more in detail uh, into is the submission and how to, in fact, uh, start a submission. You, you, will, you will have the option to click on submission services. It will take you to this page. And then you just click on the topic and click on start submission. Once you do that, uh, you will be redirected to uh, the submission IT pool. Uh, you will have to fill uh, a couple of administrative steps, and then you will arrive to this uh, page. Here, uh, what's important and are the uh, sections that I've highlighted uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, screen. On the left, you have all the info related to the call. Uh, you also have the info related to, the, uh, to your proposal, so the acronym that you, you decided. And you also have, on the left, the download part B templates. And these are uh, very important to be uh, downloaded from here and to use them in order to fill uh, the application form part B and any annex. On the right side of the screen, uh, there are also uh, squares that highlight the important part also that needs to be filled in by uh, all the applicants 
for example, up there you have the uh, part A of the application, which you need to fill in directly in the tool. You also have the GIS data, which is uh, to be uh, also encoded for each project uh, uh, in the map. And you have the part B and annexes uh, to be uploaded here. So as you can see, there are many uh, annexes. Um, what's important to note that, for example, some are not mandatory for, for this military mobility call, such as the cost-benefit analysis um, annexes and the annexes related to AFIF, which is the alternative fuel uh, facility. Uh, other than that, uh, all the other annexes are mandatory in principle. So I recommend you also, uh, as we've said before, to fill this as soon as possible, because there will always be the possibility to uh, edit them uh, later on. Be of course, if you didn't submit it. Um, a couple of tips here that we uh, wanted to give you um, is that uh, for the um, when you're creating a proposal, you will have to um, decide a title for your proposal. Here it's very important that you think of it uh, and that you um, present it in English and that you don't use uh, all uh, caps lock to uh, write it. But also uh, what's important is the uh, for the proposal abstract or the short description of the project is to have a short and factual um, description explaining what is being uh, done by the project what are the expected uh, results as clearly and as simply as, uh, as possible, because these will eventually be, um, be published online. Make sure that anybody in, in this, um, make sure that anybody can understand your uh, proposal um, and use also quantifiable results uh, for the project whenever it is possible. Um, for example, reduce travel time, improve safety and other. Uh, we've uh, decided to show you here uh, what we consider uh, an example of a good, um, good title and acronym. For example, the replacement of strategic bridges over the Alga River on E22 in Sweden. An acronym could be the bridges on E22. And we've put also an example of what we consider a very lengthy and complex uh, title for uh, your project, as you can see here, detailing the subsections, the and the sections of this um, project. Um, moving to the uh, budget requirements for the proposals, um, here you should note that the budget um, will be encoded in two parts of the application. Uh, you will have it in part A uh, as part of, a, of a structured data, and you will have it to fill it also in an Excel file to be uploaded in part B of the, um, in, in the annexes in part B. Um, so I will zoom first on the uh, part A and the budget table. This is how you will uh, see uh, the, this is how the budget table looks when you open the part A. And I will guide you a bit uh, on how to fill it for all types of proposals, being studies, um, works, or mixed in this uh, call. Um, you will have to select first the 50% uh, funding grade that you see uh, in the upper uh, left corner. And uh, you will have here also the option of 85%. But for uh, this call, uh, this is not applicable. So please do not select it. And uh, it's the 50% funding rate that will only apply. Um, the budget will be uh, here introduced per participant and based on five cost categories, uh, which are the personnel cost, the uh, subcontracting cost, and the purchase costs, as you can see here in green, highlighted. Um, also in blue, you will have the possibility to uh, extend the uh, base of this eligible cost to uh, the synergetic elements, if they are applicable, of course, in your project. And that means any cost related to uh, um, synergies with other sectors, for example, with digital or energy. Uh, and, this is, uh, and this is where you have to introduce these costs. Uh, you will, um, it's important to note also that uh, studies should be recorded in this orange um, square in case the proposal is a mixed proposal, so works and studies. But if it is um, a purely studies proposals, you can also uh, introduce it uh, 
per uh, cost category as per the works proposal. Uh, the costs for outermost region, for example, here, are currently not supported under uh, military mobility, as well as the land purchases, which are only applicable in the cohesion call of the self-transport calls. So for more details on, on this table and, and how to fill it, I really recommend you to um, consult the call document and the section related to the budget and categories and the cost eligibility rules. Uh, another uh, part, uh, another place where you have to fill the budget is this Excel file that we have some screenshots here of, of it. Um, this should be filled in uh, in Excel and uploaded as um, part of the annexes, and it is mandatory for all applications also. And But in fact, what's the difference between this and the other? It's, it's just the fact that the part A is structured based on uh, cost categories per participant, uh, while here the data is in inserted per uh, work package. Uh, so there will not be any differentiation, differentiation per cost category. So there are five fields to be filled in here in, in the order that we show. Um, you will have also to, um, to include the totals per work package per participant in reporting period. And uh, you will have, in theory, to fill the white cells the gray cells will be automatically calculated. Uh, and a very important point is that in, in step five, uh, which is the where you have to encode uh, the values from e grants differences, here you really make sure to encode the budget as you did in the uh, part A in order to avoid any inconsistencies between uh, part A and this document. Uh, and then the rest of the sheets will be filled in automatically. What's important to highlight also is that, of course, there will be uh, consequences for budget planning and structure uh, in your proposal due to the fact that you're filling this data in uh, different places. So what's important to highlight is that the, the total costs need and must match between the budget table per cost category and the uh, budget table per work package. Because in case of any divergences, the information in the structured data part A will prevail. What's also important is that uh, for you is to plan and prepare uh, your accounting in advance because any cost, um, it's important in, in fact to foresee any cost to be claimed, claimed for reimbursement in the future uh, and they should be really attrib attributable under both approaches being the uh, cost categories or the work packages when you're submitting the application. Um, so, reaching the uh, frequently asked questions, um, here we wanted to highlight two ways uh, of how you could search for them, uh, because it might get a bit tricky in, in, in the funding and tenders portal. So, what's important for you to know is that we have two types of frequently asked questions. We have the topic-related FAQs that you can directly find in the topic page, as you can see here. Uh, they all start with under self, uh, mili self transport military mobility call. Or um, you can also search for the general FAQs, and here it becomes maybe a bit more um, critical, is that you have to go to this uh, support FAQ in the funding and tenders portal. You have to search to uh, self transport, and that way you will have all the FAQs. So here, of course, you can also search by specific word, by tag, in order to make this uh, search more uh, precise and, uh, and detailed to your, uh, to your needs. And you can also uh, export uh, the FAQs to an Excel file if this is uh, easier. Uh, if you need, of course, any help in, in this process, you can contact the help desk through the uh, contact form on the funding and tenders portal. Or you can also, uh, for any technical uh, issues or access rights and rules, but you can also contact the functional mailbox Cinea Self Transport Calls for the questions that you have related to the call as such. So before concluding um, just this part, I, I wanted to summarize the uh, important st steps that we recommend you to, uh, to follow to submit a success successful application. Uh, first, the proposal must be submitted before the call deadline on the 21st of September before uh, 5 p.m. Central European time. This is very important. So for this reason, as we already said, uh, 
please avoid any last minute um, encoding of the application because uh, there might be technical issues. Um, please also remember that the proposals can only be submitted via the funding and tenders opportunities portal. It's not possible to submit anything via email later on or any annex or anything. Um, also remember that the proposal needs to be complete. Uh, it, needs for, uh, it means that it needs to include all the documents that, you, that we request and the mandatory annexes. Make sure also that uh, you use the application form and the templates that I showed you earlier, um, because these are mandatory. We will not accept any other uh, template. And uh, make sure to, of course, fill in the Part A, the GIS data, the Part B, and attach all mandatory annexes, which we will uh, detail later on in this presentation. Um, regarding just last point, uh, the scope, make sure also that the proposal fits well in the scope of the work program and the school, um, and also proofread your proposal. Uh, if you can, by someone a bit outside of, of, um, of, the, of the people that are preparing the, the proposal, and, um, and make sure that all beneficiaries, affiliated entities, and associated part partners are registered in the participant register before submitting the application. Just a final uh, clarification in case this uh, creates confusion maybe to some of you. Uh, the, the term project is being used everywhere uh, in the call text uh, in the CEF2 uh, program. Uh, in contrary to uh, what was used uh, in CEF1, uh, it was the term of action. Another clarification uh, is the work package, which is a major subdivision of the project, uh, which was equivalent to uh, activity under CEF1. Also, we have the term of task, which is a subdivision of a work package, which is also important to, to note. With that, I will uh, leave the floor to my uh, colleague, in order to present the plan briefing. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Isabel Royopla. I'm leading the evaluation team for the CEF transport calls. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, today to uh, introduce you to a new requirement that uh, ha is applicable uh, under the first uh, calls of 2023 that we are uh, now uh, launching. This is uh, the requirement of climate proving of infrastructure that has already been uh, envisaged uh, in the work program uh, for, for the period for safe transport and also safe energy, but uh, what it concerns us is for safe uh, transport and uh, particularly for this first call. What it is uh, climate proving? Actually, it's a process that, integrate, that is integrated in the development of infrastructure projects that the Commission wanted to put in place in order to uh, actually address two of the main aspects uh, that is facing the planet, that is climate change. We are talking about first uh, uh, establishing through this infrastructure the necessary mitigation measures in order to achieve uh, our climate objectives of climate neutrality by 2050. But also we are talking about uh, that this infrastructure will be resilient enough to cover with all the climate hazards that will come over the period uh, uh, that is established and is being run. So all the adaptation measures uh, that lead to uh, a climate, uh, a proper climate resilience. This process uh, has two uh, phases. One is about deep uh, screening uh, the, the, the elements uh, that might be subject to this uh, climate proving and then it comes into a detailed analysis of uh, those elements. On the first part, we are talking about the calculation of the GIG emissions and also how this infrastructure will actually have uh, overall a, car a carbon print. Then, in the second pillar, they look more into climate hazards such as floods, uh, rain, uh, that might be affecting the infrastructure. When did this happen, this new requirement for the Commission? It came uh, back in 21, uh, in September 2021. The Commission has issued uh, a particular technical guidance 
on how to establish uh, in the member states this uh, new um, exercise of verifying the, uh, pro the projects that are delivering infrastructure for the climate proving. In later on, uh, there was an accordion to this uh, notice that make it explicit that this requirement is also applicable for the RRF program and, uh, and also the structural funds projects that might have some components of infrastructure, plus a small detail on uh, uh, whether uh, the uh, all critical infrastructure is also uh, applying this procedure. When does it apply? Well, I have already replied to this question. This is us from this call and for the next calls as well. So we have been, uh, uh, we had maximum flexibility possible in safe transport for a period of a transition. We did not apply, but now, even if we have been asked to prolong it further, there is uh, no possibility and we need to actually already incorporate it in this uh, 2023 call for military mobility. How is actually being implemented? Which are the projects that will be uh, uh, um, uh, applying this requirement? Well, it's all specified, it's nothing new. It's already specified in the work program for 21-27 of self-transport. So basically, when you are submitting a proposal that deals for studies, there is no requirement to provide information on climate proofing. For works, we have a, 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 a different scenario. We have a, a two scenarios. When the project is not subject to the uh, environmental impact assessment, we don't request you that in the application you provide information on climate proofing. When the projects are subject to the EIA, we understand very well that uh, some had already started the process of the EIA when we refer to the key steps, and therefore we are being uh, uh, flexible, and this time we are not requiring that you provide information on climate-proving exercise of the concerned infrastructure. Uh, this is up to 18, uh, the period for applying uh, this is up to uh, 18 of January 2023. When was the, 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 the calls uh, closed for the 2022 calls? However, when the key steps uh, uh, have not been completed uh, uh, before, but it will be taking place after January, 18 January 2023, the applications uh, and you are under the obligation to submit the information on climate proving uh, as foreseen in this uh, uh, commission technical guidance. We have been, been already been asked through the functional mailbox, uh, what do we mean by key steps of the EIA procedure? We want to make it very, very clear that we are talking about uh, two parts of the different steps on the EIA procedure. We are talking that the project promoter has finished the EIA report, so it's prepared, and that the consultations under the EIA procedure have been completed. We are not requesting that the consent is granted, that the decision is made. So that can come later on in the implementation of the project, after the submission of the application. In order to put all of this uh, very, very clear, there is already now an, uh, a note that has been published on CIMEA website. Here you have the link that you can, uh, you can uh, download and use it at your best. Uh, and also an FAQ, as my colleague explained before, that is available on the uh, portal for, uh, for you. What actually is required? Well, the CEF2 regulation specifies that, uh, uh, that under impact, under the award criterion impact, uh, such information should be actually assessed. And that's why the climate proofing is being looked at at the level of the evaluation. So we are asking you to provide such information in order to, uh, for us to make an assessment uh, and to see whether you have been uh, using this, uh, uh, this uh, mechanism for uh, making the, the, the infrastructure climate-proof. So, 
In part B of the application form, under the section 4.3, where you have two boxes, you have the first box that is on environmental and climate impact. In there, you would be uh, asked to uh, address all what it concerns the, the, the aspects of mitigation and whether the project is consistent with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with this guidance, also in terms of the um, efficiency first principle, and that is consistent with the, the, uh, the reductions of uh, the GAG emissions. On the second box, you have uh, the climate uh, uh, resilience, and in there is where uh, we are, uh, you would be asked to provide information on the risk, on the uh, mitigation measures when there are others, climate uh, uh, risks that are taking place, and how the infrastructure will be coping with that. We wanted to give you a few tips uh, because we already know as well that some of this information you already might have it and you, it's just a matter of you looking around in the documentation that has been prepared for your project in particular under the environmental impact assessment they, you might find information that you can use already also uh, as regards the cost benefit analysis the gag reductions and the cost that go along might already be calculated, and you can use those information already for explaining uh, the type of uh, uh, measures that you are putting in place for climate mitigation and adaptation. One uh, uh, piece of advice that we wanted you to give is that whenever you have conducted the climate proofing, uh, you also attach uh, in other annexes the, that my colleague Natasha explained that there is a, a slot in which you can upload the, the summary of the climate proofing process in there as a proof that this has been uh, undertaken, though this is not compulsory. So... I would now move, we will now move to the uh, part of uh, assessing, uh, uh, giving you an, uh, uh, an overview of the evaluation process and the award criteria, some lessons learned that my colleague will start uh, presenting the first part. Yes, thank you. Um, we will now move to the part related to the evaluation process and award criteria that will be presented by Isabel and I. And we will also uh, highlight important lessons learned uh, for you that we have gathered from previous, um, previous calls. For that reason, we take uh, the, uh, illustration, this illustration to give you an idea of the different steps of the evaluation process that uh, we conduct. So this starts with the call closure with, for, this, uh, for this call. It will be the 21st of September 2023, where uh, the admissibility and eligibility checks will start automatically after. And this is conducted by CINEA ex exclusively. Uh, then this is followed by uh, the uh, external evaluation, which is assisted where we call for external experts uh, to uh, help us with the assessment of these proposals. Uh, after concluding the individual assessment and the, um, the uh, collective assessments, uh, we uh, will move to the, will be able to move to the internal evaluation uh, of uh, where, in fact, the different DGs of the Commission will meet to uh, decide on a list of proposals that will be uh, presented to the selection committee. Once the selection committee adopts this or decides to go on with this list, this is presented also to the staff committee. And only when the green light is, is given by them, uh, we will be able to invite the applicants to, uh, to start preparing the grant agreements, or we will uh, reject uh, applicants um, that uh, for which we cannot retain their proposals. Uh, bear in mind that this is a very, uh, in most cases, it's a, it's a big competition between the proposals, and uh, we and those who will be in fact reject, rejected. Um, it's important to take this as a as a feedback that we're giving in order uh, for you as a feedback for future possible uh, resubmissions. 
Uh, this whole process takes approximately around four months. Um, and uh, with this, I will stop on the first stop of, this, um, of the steps that we have. And uh, this concerns the admissibility checks. So what are the admissibility checks? Uh, here, I would like to refer you to section five of the call document where it's very clearly stated. Um, here we check the, that, of course, the proposal is submitted on time, uh, that the forms are, are, that everything is inside of the submission system, and that the proposal is complete, meaning that part A is filled in, as I already explained, that part B is also uploaded, um, and that the mandatory annexes are all there. It's very important here to take a moment to explain the mandatory annexes. Um, first, starting by uh, the fact that, um, the, as we said also before, the cost-benefit analysis is uh, not required for the military mobility application, but all the other annexes uh, that you see here are uh, applicable and mandatory for all applicants. Um, we have first the agreement by the concerned member state being one of the important annexes that this is the uh, member state that is benefiting from the project. We have the military network map declaration that needs to be also uploaded for all applications uh, and duly also signed and stamped by the, re by the concerned ministry. Uh, we need to have also the detailed budget table per work package and calculator that I showed you earlier. Uh, we also need uh, the timetable and gun chart. This is a bit uh, um, up to you how you want to present it. Um, and there's the environmental compliance file. Here I will stop a bit and uh, highlight again that this file is very important for all applications meaning for work applications, for studies with physical interventions, and for studies even without physical interventions. But for these, um, so for example, for these studies without physical intervention, or for example, for works projects that do not affect significantly the environment, this file must be uploaded in any case, but you can tick the applicable box of the project type. So for example, studies without physical intervention or if it's a work, and include in the comment boxes for each question not applicable. But in general, this file is very important to be uploaded. Another man um, mandatory annexes are the activity reports of last year and the list of previous projects. These, these are the key projects from the last four years, and the template, you can also see it in, at the end of the application part B. Here, um, only um, the, so, so it's important, in fact, for the operational capacity check of all applicants, but we have exceptions, for example, for public bodies, for member state organizations, for international organizations, and also of beneficiaries uh, of grants under CEF1 and CEF2. So in general, we would require this uh, to private entities that are new to the CEF program. Um, we, so here we wanted to um, highlight a couple of lessons learned about this, this part of the admissibility check that we noticed uh, in the previous applications, is that we, in fact, had a lot of incomplete application forms. As I was talking before, um, mostly this was about the environmental compliance file. And for example, here I give you examples, uh, this file was not submitted in some cases, or it was not duly signed, it was not dated, the, the declarations of the Natura 2000 and the Water Framework di Directive were not dated and stamped. Uh, so here I say again that the environmental compliance file must be submitted, if not the proposal will be inadmissible. And it's not enough just to also submit it, it if, it, if it's applicable, the environmental compliance file must be comprehensively completed, meaning it needs to have the necessary approval by the competent authorities, and that it also needs to have the information that are required in uh, the questionnaire. Um, so here it means that even if the information is available somewhere else in the application, it's very important to put it in, in this file. 
and that also to have all the documents to attach them with this uh, file, attach all the documents that are um, important for, for your project. For example, if there is a screening decision, this should be also uploaded. If not, this, all of that will have, in fact, a negative impact on, on the evaluation of your proposal. Other lessons learned that are important uh, in our view is that, for example, in some cases we had um, up, um, proposals without a requested um, grant in Part A, or for example, there were a wrong budget uploaded in, in this part, and this, of course, means that we also had inconsistencies between the section of the budget of Part A and the detailed uh, budget table in Part B. So please uh, remember to double check and triple check this, um, these two budgets. Um, also, we had, for example, cases where the member state agreement is not signed, and this, is, um, this leads also to the inadmissibility of the proposal. So that's very important. Or, or, or also we had situation where the military network map declaration was not signed or was not submitted. Uh, we also had situations of missing activity reports and list of previ previous projects that were not submitted. And we had cases where the contract, for example, referred to other projects than the ones submitted. So that's why this is also highlight that it's very important to uh, double check these annexes that you're uploading. Uh, reaching the second uh, step, which is the eligibility check, and here you can also see all the details in section 5 of the core documents. But what we, what we would like to highlight is that um, applicants uh, need to be legal entities in order to be able to submit the uh, applications of being public or private bodies and need to be established in the EU member states. The activities also that uh, will be proposed uh, need to be within the scope of the of the topic described in section two of the call document, where you have all these details. Also, as it was mentioned before, uh, the geographic location of the project needs to be on the TNT network, being core or comprehensive. But also, and importantly for this call, is that they need to be located on the EU military transport network. Uh, the duration of the project for works or mixed projects uh, should be four to five years maximum. And for studies project, this should be uh, two or three years maximum. Two points here to highlight about the uh, duration. First is that the earliest starting day uh, of, uh, of the proposal may be the proposal submission. So here, for example, the earlier you submit the, uh, uh, your proposal, uh, the earlier your cost will be taken into account. And the end date cannot be also later than uh, December 2027. Uh, in addition, we have also, uh, we, what we check is the budget, and that the budget is re that is requested is, um, so in fact, any budget requested is admitted, but we strongly recommend you to have a minimum of 1 million euro of requested contribution in order to ensure the efficiency of the uh, EU grants. Uh, to end this part, we also had a couple of lessons learned from previous calls. Um, for example, we had situations where proposals were submitted by applicants from non-eligible countries. We had also uh, specifically a situation where uh, a lot of proposals were not on the TNT or were not connected to the TNT network, or also were not on the EU military transport network. We had situations where the project start date was different between part A and B. We had project durations that were wrongly calculated. Uh, we had project proposals also being out of scope. Uh, and we had, uh, for example, issues with the compliance with the relevant dual use requirements and their values because they were not sufficiently explained in the proposal. And we also had, um, I mean, in general, the part of the proposal or the global project that were not sufficiently clear. Uh, with that, I will leave the floor again to Isabel for the part related to the award criteria. 
We have in total five uh, uh, work criteria against what uh, we are doing the, the evaluation of your proposals. We uh, score them from zero to five. This means that a minimum threshold would be 15 points out of the, uh, uh, the outstanding proposals that might reach to the maximum, that is 25 uh, points. All the, the, the five uh, need to be on a threshold above the three, uh, the three points. So you, we need to respect anyway the pass mark of three, uh, of three points under each. The first uh, uh, award criteria uh, is the priority and urgency. As explained, urgency will be uh, actually a look into uh, the current situation after the, the, uh, the Russian war of aggression against, uh, against Ukraine. So that would be an element to, to have it in mind. So uh, urgency always deals with uh, situations like uh, also uh, taking into account the development of the solidarity lanes uh, on the, uh, on the neighbouring EU member states and, and Moldova. Uh, having said that, uh, when we look at priority, we look uh, uh, whether the proposal corresponds to the overall EU objectives uh, in terms of the, green, the European Green Deal or any other sectorial uh, strategies, maybe the, the sustainable and smart mobility strategy that has been uh, launched uh, and known uh, to you, and also the Fit uh, for 55 uh, package that was also announced by the European Commission. So all this is being assessed whether your proposal is contributing uh, positively to uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the European Green Deal overall. We also look at the development, of course, of the TNT network. This is uh, the core business of, of uh, your proposal, uh, we assume, uh, along with, uh, uh, in, in your case, uh, uh, the military uh, mobility aspects. So those that will include uh, cross-border links, as stated in part three of the annex of the self regulations, are being assessed uh, uh, very thoroughly as well, and whether your proposal will be uh, uh, contributing to the development of uh, the core network uh, corridors, uh, or they are also part of, uh, of those plans that have been established, and whether your proposal has actually a network effect uh, uh, for those uh, for developing that infrastructure that will be uh, uh, actually contributing to the development of the of the TNT network. We look at very closely to, to your proposal whether your proposal address the objectives as described in the topic uh, uh, of uh, this call. So uh, have that in mind. It has to really uh, be along the scope as defined of this topic. Then uh, the EU added value of your proposal, not just at the level of the national or regional local level. It has to be uh, uh, demonstrated that there is a, 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 an EU interest in, in, in your proposal for us uh, to, be, to be selected. Another aspect that will be asked to you is whether your project has synergies with other EU programs. And if it is the case, or it might be the case, in, uh, for instance, that you have synergies with the recovery and resilience plans uh, instrument, uh, you need already to specify it under this section. Uh, uh, or if you are uh, having uh, synergies in terms of other e programs like Horizon you, Innovation Fund, you need to tell us in this section whether you also might have uh, some synergies with the other safe transport sector, energy and digital. This is the place in which you need to explore and, and develop this uh, in, uh, information. And if, uh, as already uh, said before, if there are synergetic elements uh, only applicable for work topics, then uh, you, you also need to, to specify in this section. Yes, very much also. Uh, the importance of uh, your proposal in light of the dual use uh, potential. Uh, and this is the, uh, when uh, you need to explain if uh, the infrastructure is compliant uh, with the military uh, requirements decision and also whether uh, it has a, a relevance in terms of dual use uh, uh, of this infrastructure. The next point is maturity, and as uh, you might know, this is one of the key elements in the evaluation of the proposals, because we really want to implement uh, 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 the, uh, the projects in Europe that are mature, 
and that are ready to start. So here is where you would need to specify by when you intend to start uh, the project and by when you need to complete. Uh, and is where uh, you are fully responsible. And this is what we call as well the technical maturity of the project. And we look very much uh, uh, close to see whether a, a project can deliver the, the results that are being planned by the period of implementation that is being proposed. Um, we also look, and you will be asked to describe the dates by when uh, or if already uh, granted uh, uh, the permits or any con con contracting uh, procedures that might be uh, already awarded to the, to the works. So this is something that uh, uh, we clearly understand is beyond the remit of the applicants, but is also uh, 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 all this detailed information has to be contained in the application. We, we will be looking as well how mature financially the project is, so that if you have seek uh, for funding or you have secured that funding in order to uh, bridge uh, uh, all the, uh, the gaps that are needed so that you can specify here whether you, you, you have uh, secured that, that, those funds. In terms of uh, when we also need to have and we look at so that you have in mind uh, that we will look at the correspondence between the technical planning that you have in terms of the work packages and by when are estimated the cost and also the financial profile. So we will see whether there is a correspondence or, for instance, you uh, indicate that 90% will be for the last year. Clearly, this will be showing that uh, the technical maturity, even if uh, uh, you state it in the budget, might not be as high as it was uh, in intended. So... Just a reminder for you uh, that uh, one of the critical elements uh, is that uh, uh, for a pro works proposals, we need to ensure that when they are a, a subject to the EIA, that the key steps have been completed. So this means that the EIA report has been prepared by the project promoter, but also that the consultations have been carried out. This is a, a strong requirement. Uh, in terms of maturity of a pro proposal that we look closely and then that uh, the development consent can come after. The quality, uh, under quality, uh, uh, you would need to provide us information on the operational capacity check uh, that we will carry out in this uh, criterion is where we assess the competence and the experience of the applicants in implementing similar projects and that they have the, the project teams that can implement such a, such a, such a project. And, and normally, if it is positive, the conclusion, uh, uh, that's a, a good way forward for uh, assessing how good a proposal can be implemented. So, from the side of uh, the implementation plans, that you, you would need to closely look into the technical, but also the financial. So, please, um, the work packages need to be well structured, well detailed. Uh, uh, a proposal that just has one work package uh, or two um, and has a high volume of funding might be not ideal. ideal. So, try to find out uh, how the work packages can be broken down uh, in making it uh, a, a meaningful project, but at the same time that can be uh, useful for, for later on for implementing uh, easily, but also for our evaluation purposes as well. So design uh, uh, approach on how you would establish the organizational structures in terms of project management teams and how you're intending to establish will be also assessed very, very closely. So it's important that you detail this information in, in, the, in this part of the application form. Keep in mind that a solid and a, a, and a very good proposal will always see that anticipates any risks that during the implementation might happen, but just not naming them. And you have also a, a part in order to uh, make your analysis of the risk, but also all the mitigations that you need to address in order to overcome in case it happens. So this is, uh, uh, again, about ensuring that there is all the controls and the quality procedures are well set up in, in, in your team for managing the project. Um, one thing we, we like very much, our CEF uh, logo. So please make sure that when you undertake the implementation of the project, you put the stars on it 
and this is uh, when uh, you develop what kind of plan you have in terms of communication, what are your, uh, your measures in order to ensure that during the construction and after you will make sure that, uh, that Europe has helped your project uh, to be established. One thing that is very important is that we want to build a new infrastructure or upgrade uh, the current one uh, for dual use in this case, but also we want to make sure that you have thought already about uh, keeping the infrastructure longer than just for the period uh, of construction. So when you finish the, the, the project, uh, that's why we are asking you to tell us how you make uh, the project uh, sustainable and you will keep uh, in good shape afterwards. In terms of impact, uh, you would be asked to provide information uh, on the socioeconomic benefits of the project because uh, this is a part in which uh, we are actually looking into projects that are economically viable as it is uh, a requirement of the 10 guidelines. We need Actually, uh, the, the projects of common interest need to be uh, economically viable. So that it's, uh, all this information needs to be provided. It doesn't mean that we are asking you, uh, as it has already been said, we are not requiring the CBA uh, analysis for these projects, but uh, we are confident that you have thought about uh, what are the socio and economic benefits of the projects, and you can come up by telling us uh, all the required information that is in the application form in this regard. Uh, an aspect to looking under impact would be, uh, again, uh, to highlight the environmental and climate impact in, in the light of the, uh, of the climate proofing, but also uh, you would, uh, if uh, your project uh, uh, contributes to the climate change uh, targets, uh, please also uh, be generous in telling us in the application form whether it actually reduced the air pollutants uh, or the greenhouse gas, gas emissions as well. Don't, don't, don't be shy on this. Uh, and then uh, 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 if you can, as I said before, you might have all this information already coming from the climate proofing analysis, uh, please bring it forward under this section of, uh, of impact. In terms of climate resilience for work proposals, again, is about making sure that you have thought about uh, how vulnerable the, the, the infrastructure is against any climate hazards. So you, you, you need to come up uh, by telling us uh, uh, this, this information in, the, in this part of the application form. Also, if uh, you have carried out a climate proving uh, analysis, bring it forward in this part of the application form. Impact is about also uh, a look, uh, when you are thinking about putting the project in place, uh, most likely you will have uh, been facing issues of congestion on, on, on using too much, uh, for instance, the road, or, or, or there are uncertain issues that provide uh, the, that you really need to address. So please bring any element that you think uh, it will improve as the model is split, the safety and security of the, of the infrastructure, if it has improved, the, can improve the service, the quality service of uh, to passengers, to the freight sector, or if uh, it reduces in some aspects the noise uh, in some parts of, uh, of the infrastructure. For the studies, uh, uh, exclusively studies topics, um, where you would be asked to provide information, how useful is the study itself? Is it helping for further development of the project? Is it actually uh, helping uh, to make a decision on going ahead for the works to start? So this is uh, also the elements that you need to think when uh, putting forward the, the information for this part. And then any aspect that uh, you think is positive in terms of improving the interoperability of the transport systems, of the, mo of the modes, or digitalization, uh, enhancing the competition uh, uh, in the benefit of, uh, of, the, of the users, uh, any kind of further development at the level of the regional or local, if there is any benefit on the land use, and if outer outermost regions when applicable, of course. On catalytic effect, this is the, the, um, the last we are looking, uh, and this is where you would need to, uh, to prove to us that uh, um, it's uh, having 
an effect. So the SEF funding that we provide to you, it's not just a grant, but it actually helps to realize the project in the best way uh, uh, that if it will not have received that. So it should, in principle, think about that the quality of the, uh, of the implementation will be enhanced because uh, there will be better technical parameters, so you could invest uh, in making uh, that infrastructure even better than not receiving the funds. Think about uh, that uh, also you can prove that you are overcoming uh, any financial obstacles in seeking a loan, for instance, or that you would uh, make sure that uh, you, you can have uh, the financial viability thanks to having the self-funding granted. Um, another aspect that uh, we have observed, and it's also an element that you can think uh, on putting forward, is that is it uh, any kind of effect uh, in terms of the stakeholders' engagement? Uh, um, it's the project being accepted thanks to the SEF grant. So these are the elements that uh, we are uh, actually uh, asking as information, but you need to reflect if this is the case and that you can demonstrate it in your proposal. And uh, think that uh, the catalytic effect can also be proven to us by the fact that the, the grant has a financial leverage so that it can mobilize other financial sources by having the grant in terms of uh, uh, public or private investments and overall accelerating the investment plan of your projects thanks to the SEF grant. We have observed and we wanted to share with you some lessons learned uh, through this uh, evaluation of proposals in, under the previous calls that uh, despite uh, having given guidance and also in the application form, you have guiding elements that can help you. And also this presentation uh, should be actually followed uh, during preparing your proposal. Uh, we have uh, uh, received a, a proposal that have a low quality in the description of these sections that we were um, uh, describing. So uh, one example, the work packages are not detailed clearly with very insufficient milestones or deliverables that the work packages include many, many different tasks that make our evaluation very difficult because it, it could also see that some parts of that work package uh, might be ineligible. And, and if it would have been completely uh, uh, separated, it could help for the judgment of the experts as well. So think to, as again, structuring the work packages by, by in a way that can uh, be meaningful for you, but also for later on for, for us to evaluate uh, properly the different tasks. We have also observed there are limited uh, risk analysis uh, in the proposals with the incomplete mitigation measures mentioned that the project impact in terms of, uh, because there are three sections, as I have, I have explained before, are not filling or very little information, which actually doesn't help you in getting the highest uh, score under, under impact. Uh, and then I, uh, one thing that uh, we also uh, observe is that uh, the communication strategy or the communication uh, measures have not been thought and this is, uh, I think, something very easy to, to put, be put on a proposal, and, and, but it has been very uh, baggedly described. So with uh, no further uh, aspects, we will now run to the question and answer section. Uh, in there, uh, uh, with my colleague uh, Philippe Chantren from DigiMove, uh, we will actually uh, uh, start uh, making questions that we have received uh, during the last days, as you have seen in, the, in our call page of CINEA, in the, in, the, in the agenda, we had specified here that uh, in order to enhance the efficiency of, uh, of uh, uh, processing your questions, that you would put them in our functional mailbox, which is actually the one that uh, uh, applicants can submit proposals, I am, I am pro sorry, the questions, and therefore if uh, some of the questions that we will now uh, be replying are not being replied, they would be doing, we will be doing our, our best to get it in the next day so you get your replies. Um, so, 
We will start uh, first with the most specific uh, uh, questions related to the topic of military mobility. And, and Philip, uh, uh, does the project need to be located on the TNT network? Yes, indeed, it has to be on the TNT network in order to demonstrate its dual use. So the civilian use is shown by being on the TNT network, but it has also to be on the military network because it has also to show the military dimension. So for the TNT network, as said, the basis is the TNT regulation of 2013 for the uh, identification of the EU military transport network we have the council decision of May this year, which will be the basis for the uh, evaluation and checking of eligibility of the proposals which will be submitted in this call. Can a project be financed under military mobility call if it's not located on the current TNT network, but might be included? in the future TNT network following uh, the revision of the TNT guidelines? So here the clear answer is no. Uh, the TNT revision is currently going on. Parliament and Council are negotiating this new regulation. They are in trilogues and we expect that the new regulation would enter into force only next year, by which time we will have already closed the evaluation of this call. So in order to, um, we cannot speculate what is the outcome of that process. So for the call, the current legal framework is applicable. The current 10 network as defined in the 2013 regulation is the basis. And as just said, at the same time, the project has to be on the EU military transport network as updated in May 23. Next question. Are the proposals located on either the TNT core or comprehensive network eligible for funding? Indeed, there are both projects on the core <clears throat> and on the comprehensive network are eligible for funding. And when it comes to military mobility, it is important to underline that we do not have the normal prioritization of core network over the comprehensive network. In our general CEF calls, obviously, we are focusing our efforts on the core network because here the deadline for implementation is 2030 and the urgency is higher. But for military uh, uh, mobility, um, this um, categorization is, in terms of prioritization, less relevant. And hence, both projects on core and comprehensive are not only eligible both, but they are all in terms of prioritization equal. We are running out of questions. No, no, no. <laughs> unfortunately it doesn't work. We are just one second. Here we so go. Uh, yeah. Okay. Should the project address all infrastructure requirements applicable to categories of dual use infrastructure action as defined in the Commission Implementing Regulation 2021-1328? So in order to be eligible, it is not necessary that the project does address all dual use requirements uh, as defined in the implementing regulation. Um, the Proposal should be very clear which dual use requirements it addresses and should explain uh, if certain uh, requirements are not addressed, why is this the case, so that uh, it is a very clear proposal and we can take that into account in the evaluation. Are any of the dual use requirements defined in the Commission implementing regulation uh, given a higher priority? No, uh, here, as uh, with the core and comprehensive network, all the requirements are of equal priority. Of course, uh, the, um, the project should address identified needs, um, and they should be explained well, both in terms of civilian needs and of military mobility needs, so that we can have a very clear picture of the and, um, of the usefulness of the project and its priority, and this will be 
assessed under the priority and urgency requirement uh, award criteria. What information should be provided in the application form regarding the project compliance with the dual use requirements defined in the Commission implementing regulation uh, that we mentioned before? Yes, so here we have the application form in the technical description in the part B and the point zero project description. Here you should clearly describe which dual use requirements are addressed by the project um, and this should be uh, substantiated, so explained and then proved to be necessary with sufficient technical data so that we can get a very clear picture of the project and understand well how the project complies with uh, certain of the standards of the dual use uh, requirements implementing regulation. Um, and we can see how the project fits the dual use uh, requirements. Are ERTMS deployment? interlockings and or GSMR components, recharging infrastructure and retrofitting of rail freight noisy wagons eligible under military mobility call? So they are not eligible uh, for uh, several reasons. So in the area of ERTMS, including the interlocking devices or GSMR components, recharging infrastructure and retrofitting of noisy rail freight wagons, they are not eligible, they take the form of unit contributions in the general calls and have not been identified under the military side as being uh, of uh, relevance when it comes to military mobility. Is the electrification of line tracks an upgrade uh, construction of electrification systems eligible for funding under military mobility? Yes, indeed, electrification of line tracks is uh, an activity which falls very well into the uh, military mobility environment. So here it can be the uh, electrification of line tracks or the upgrade and constructions of electrification systems. Um, and we have uh, dual use requirement number five, which explains that the electrification backup systems, which are relevant for stations, or multimodal handling facilities uh, would be in, but not for railway lines. So here an important clarification indeed. We have also a couple of general questions, which I will address to you, Isabel. Good. So uh, which ministry should assign the letter of support, member state agreement and the military network map declaration? Actually, the letter of support, uh, also known as member state uh, agreement, uh, must be signed by the competent ministry uh, in, in that member state. That might be uh, normally the, the ministry competent for transport and infrastructure. And for the uh, military network map declaration, we are again talking about the competent authority for signing the military network ma map. Normally, that would be the Ministry of Defense. Exactly, to underline that this is an important part of our whole military mobility uh, activities that we bring the different ministries together so that we have a good understanding on the two sides and two sides agree, both on transport and on defense side, that this is an important project for dual use and hence submitted in the calls. And actually this uh, triggers uh, the, the, uh, the eligibility, so it's uh, the admissibility. So if uh, that document is missing or is not signed, it might be an issue uh, in that regard. Next question then, what are the requirements for the submission of the environmental compliance file? Still, we are being asked uh, in several instances about clarifying this, and, and even if uh, we have already uh, brought to you during the, the eligibility part, explain, we wanted to again uh, remind that uh, applic applicants must submit, meaning uploading in the system, the environmental compliance file for all applications. So this is a requirement that nobody can escape. Uh, however, when you, we are talking about work up, works applications and studies applications with physical intervention, uh, the, the ECF must be completed with the environmental compliance questionnaire, that is the first part of the document, completed, duly, duly fill in with all the required information, plus 
the, 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 the reports that are needed also to be uploaded in case that there is a, a non-technical summary that is making reference on a specific part of the, the, the file. Again, the declarations uh, need to be signed, stamped by the, the competent authorities uh, uh, and, and uh, whether they're monitoring for the Natura 2000 when it is uh, a Water Framework Directive uh, Authority that is affected by the project, it has to be provided by the call closure. However, because this is something that we recurrently have been asked, when the studies projects uh, don't, ha don't have any physical intervention, or there are works that do not significantly uh, affect the environment, and in the FAQ we have specified those. So uh, in that respect, uh, you just need to tick the box of uh, the applicable category of your project, plus uh, uh, um, indicate in the other boxes, not applicable, not applicable, not applicable. Okay? So that's, uh, again, a clarification that uh, we wanted to, again, put it. I think it's very important to underline that all our projects have to comply with environmental legislation. Uh, so it is not because a project is a dual use project or uh, mm -hmm. an important project in military mobility uh, that the uh, requirements or the, the acquis on environment is waived. Um, so this is very important to assess the project and really be clear in the application. Also in the case it is not applicable by uh, submitting this information that it is not applicable. Indeed, because uh, as, as we said during the, the, the presentation, the information must be uh, comprehensively contained in this file as it would be looking to for further environmental compliance assessment. So therefore, it's important that even if you think the information is somewhere else in the application part B, you need, uh, even if uh, uh, it's already there, repeat it, put it back. In this, in this environmental compliance file. Another question on the ECF, the environmental compliance mm. file. Under SEF transport, how should the environmental compliance file be completed if there are works taking place in different countries or items subject to different environmental requirements? Actually, uh, the ECF uh, must be completed by uh, the applicants from all the concerned member states where the works take place. So it if takes place in, in two different parts uh, of, uh, of a border, it has to be by, by, by the two. The declarations uh, uh, must be provided and, and uh, when those uh, works are being taken place in, in those two parts, it needs to be duly fill in uh, and submitted in the system. Exactly. Still on the environmental compliance file, is it necessary to have an information sheet or a report on the environmental impact of the project at the stage of applying for funding? In fact, it's just to repeat again that the application that includes works uh, for which an environmental impact assessment is mandatory, they must demonstrate uh, in the application form that the key steps of the EIA uh, procedure have been undertaken. And in that respect, uh, uh, the applicant uh, will need to, uh, to, to demonstrate as much as possible that the, the, the report by the EIA report has been carried out uh, and also the consultations in line with the EIA, EIA uh, procedure. Absolutely, and of course, as, uh, if a project is further in the environmental impact assessment and has already completed it, this will be positively noted under the maturity criteria. So we really encourage project promoters to have uh, completed as much as possible in these procedures before applying for funding that increases maturity and increases the likelihood of the projects being carried out within the time frame foreseen. Mm. Another question, is it possible to reuse the environmental declaration submitted during the preceding year for a project that is re being resubmitted? Well, uh, it has to be uh, make sure that, uh, uh, that uh, any document or declaration actually match the intended project that you are submitting. Uh, there should not be any reference to a previous uh, project being uh, uh, submitted before. 
uh, you might have to take you must have to, uh, to take into account that the declarations remain valid for the period that you are submitted the, submitting the proposal and if not then if there are for instance uh, uh, changes uh, at the uh, at the legislative uh, at the legal framework or that the project scope has uh, been changed in the new submission in such a case uh, you would need to seek for uh, uh, the declarations uh, to be signed uh, by the competent uh, environmental authorities obviously you can never make reference to a previously submitted proposal for any aspect no. because the evaluators will not look at previously submitted proposals they are not even accessible to them no. so everything has to be uh, submitted in one go and be uh, comprehensive and complete. Correct. Climate proofing. Is it required that infrastructure projects for which environmental consent was issued without an EIA to present the climate proofing analysis? For this call, there is no requirement to provide information if the project is not subject to the EIA, but if the information on climate impact assessment is available to the applicant and to you, uh, it doesn't harm to add it in the application form. Absolutely. Uh, second question on the climate proofing. Is there any other climate proofing analysis required in case of work projects for which the AIA was carried out and environmental consent was issued before the 18th of January 2023? The project is not required to provide information on climate proofing when the key steps that are known now by, uh, to you, as we have been uh, uh, repeating during this info day, of the EIA were completed before January 18, uh, 2023. However, if again the information is available through the EIA or, or, or other elements or analysis that uh, you might have undertaken for preparing your proposal, uh, be generous, put it on the application form uh, in this section 4.3. It can only strengthen your application indeed. A uh, question on climate proofing or climate tracking. How are the climate proofing and climate tracking of projects assessed in the evaluation? Well, uh, the climate proofing analysis of the climate proofing of infrastructure uh, is, be is being taken into account during the evaluation of a project under the impact criterion. But this is an, a different exercise as from climate tracking. It should not be confused. Uh, climate uh, tracking is uh, a separate uh, uh, exercise that is being not part of our evaluation. You might, uh, in, in other EU programs, they might have it incorporated as a part of the evaluation. In self transport, we don't do so, so because we have developed a methodology together with DigiMove uh, in which we uh, specify a percentage uh, of the climate tracker uh, in each project when the project is selected for, for funding. And it's at that moment that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, assessed if the project would be, uh, uh, which percentage would be lo uh, uh, located, allocated, and how much it contributes to the climate objective. I would be a bit proud because uh, uh, Safe Transport uh, has uh, uh, an ambition of, in the work program of reaching the 70% in contributing to climate objectives. And in fact, in the last election, just yesterday, uh, uh, we discovered that it's 82%. So we, we are making, a, a, I think, a big difference to our planet by implementing the self transport. Just to be blunt about it, so climate tracking is something you don't have to care about. Once your project is selected, we uh, do the assessment and uh, develop or, or come to these uh, climate tracking indicators, but it is not for you to take care of that in the application. The starting dates. Um, in the call text, it is stated that the starting date will be after grant signature. Retroactive application can be granted exceptionally for duly justified reasons, but never earlier than the submission date. Can you give an example? Indeed, uh, the starting date for the CEF projects, uh, uh, it's fixed in the grant uh, uh, agreement uh, uh, preparation. Generally, it can uh, be, can normally it would be at the time that the grant uh, agreement is signed. However, upon request of the beneficiary, it can also be that the date of the submission is 
a date of, elig of eligible for, uh, uh, for stipulating the period of eligibility of the action. So it can be uh, uh, the date of uh, your submission. And of course, the earlier you submit, the earlier the submission date would be Correct. Uh, to make certain costs eligible. eligible. Part A of the application, which pre-identified links have to be selected in the application part A? Okay, here you will see in part A that uh, there is a drop-down menu that makes you choose uh, the pre-identified links. Uh, those are related to missing links and cross-border links that are on the core network corridors or uh, missing links on the comprehensive network as duly defined under the CEF2 regulations. And, and, and those are available for you to check, to, to, be, to be selected. This means that any other section that it doesn't correspond to the corridor alignment is not displayed. And you don't need to mine, you don't need to choose and, and uh, even if uh, you will get a bur uh, warning, but, uh, warning message, leave it, ignore it, go on. Uh, it doesn't affect uh, uh, the application itself. Just to underline that uh, being part of a missing link or cross-border link as identified in the CEF2 regulation is not providing any priority or uh, anything else to the project in the evaluation of the military mobility calls, as we said. Here, uh, all the projects on the TENT network are on an equal footing and will be assessed in the specific circumstances of military mobility. So this is more for reporting reason that it is interesting to know whether a project is on such a section, but it is not an element that will be uh, determining for the priority and urgency of a project. So yeah, the, on the part B, uh, equally a question. Is it necessary to describe the funding gap of the project even if no CBA is required? Actually, the funding gap is part of the assessment of the catalytic effect criterion. This is specified uh, already in Article uh, 9 of the Code text uh, that it says that the EU finance uh, financial assistance on the realization of the project, for instance, by overcoming the financial gap. So it's in that context that uh, any information that uh, you might have in this respect uh, that you put it forward in the application. Uh, again, we are not asking for a CBA, uh, uh, but we are only asking the related information that you might have uh, uh, at your disposal in order to, to, to say that the, 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 the CEF grant uh, is having a, a, making a difference to the implementation of the project. Exactly. Um, there are some general frequently asked questions, including text from the 2021 and 2022 CEF transport calls. Are these frequently asked questions also applicable to the current call for proposals? Indeed, we were approached uh, uh, by certain applicants that were concerned whether those were uh, still relevant or not. Uh, bear in mind, we do a, a, a check. We review all the FAQs that are in the tool, uh, in, in, on the portal, and those that are there, they are still uh, uh, those that are relevant, they are published, so uh, you can consult them and, uh, at any time because we have made sure that it's, it's, it, they are valid FAQs. So a huge source of information um, and we certainly invite you to browse through them because you will find a wealth of information that will be useful in preparing your application. Absolutely. That was it. That's all. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to end the day uh, this uh, afternoon, I would say. It's been a real pleasure for us, for the team, uh, uh, I guess, from, from DigiMove, uh, from UMS, who were there, uh, and, and also for CINEA colleagues. Uh, you don't see them, but there are a few uh, uh, here in the room. And uh, they make possible that we provide you a, a two hours info day. Uh, full of information of uh, in terms of what we have in our portfolio already now for military, military mobility, which is a new component of the CEF2 uh, uh, transport sector. Uh, Mr. Chantren uh, gave us an overview of the policy context, uh, uh, the priorities of the call. UMS reminded about how they assess your proposals in terms of the military dimension uh, in light of the dual use 
And then uh, my colleague uh, responsible for the running the evaluation, Natasha, uh, show you how to make a, 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 an application in the system. As you know, now you are already knowing the new tool in, in, in grants. Uh, we also gave you a, an overview on the climate proofing of infrastructure, the new requirement. And we run through how the evaluation procedure is, is being done here at CINEA. Uh, in terms of uh, giving you a bit of hints, uh, giving you a bit of uh, the flavor of the things that we want to hear for, from you uh, 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 when preparing the application also in the sections of the award criteria. There are five, as, as uh, you, might, uh, you have heard from us. We gave you a bit of tips um, in terms of uh, uh, what uh, uh, lessons learned we have uh, gathered over these uh, uh, previous calls. And uh, as uh, we were collectively together uh, uh, during the last days, uh, uh, some questions from you, we put a presentation uh, that we have been just uh, uh, running through the most uh, uh, frequent questions that were uh, posed on our functional mailbox. Having said that, those questions, or if you have questions during now, it's a very condensed uh, uh, two hours that we had available. We will invite you, please don't hesitate one second to put it on the functional mailbox. We will look into, the, uh, into them and we will reply uh, as quickly as, as we can uh, so that you have uh, uh, sufficient time for preparing uh, the, your proposal. Uh, I would also like to uh, invite you to give us feedback, how you feel during these uh, two hours. If you uh, could please uh, uh, provide uh, in this uh, um, uh, in the in this slide, you have a slice 2023 meal mop. You would be able actually uh, to get uh, uh, through the survey on the questions in order for us to improve uh, or if necessary or simply that uh, you give us uh, your uh, you share your happiness of being with us during these two hours um i don't have any other thing to say i don't know philip uh, i uh, Natasha. would just like to underline the political importance of this exercise military mobility is uh, on the top of the agenda we have to improve the situation on the ground and i think with our military mobility envelope, we are doing so. So we are very much looking forward to good proposals coming for you and very much uh, looking forward to implement the best projects in the coming years. Always before 21st uh, September this year. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much.